And good evening. It sure is good to see all of you here tonight. I am likewise glad that you have chosen to set aside your Monday night during your week uh, to set aside this time to come and fellowship with the saints here and also to, uh, to hear a portion of God's word. I appreciate Brother Hiram's uh, kind words, and, and certainly I, I respect Brother David Anderson very much. I, I have a, a high respect for authority in general. I have a, a high respect for elders in the Lord's church. But I'm here to tell you that his mama is a powerful force at the Timberland Church of Christ as well, and you neglected to mention that, and I won't tell her. But uh, this, she is a fine lady. Uh, I love her dearly, uh, and she knows how to to wield influence in a godly way uh, within the local congregation, and I, I appreciate her very much. So uh, it is, uh, it's good uh, to, uh, to know her and to, uh, to know that family. I would uh, ask you, if you would, to take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 4. If you are biblically ambidextrous, you can go ahead and keep a uh, hand there at Matthew 28 if you were already there. Uh, we will arrive back there in, in just a, a few minutes. But I want to just ask you a, uh, just a general question as we get into the lesson tonight. Have you ever noticed that there are things that, are, that seem so easily understood biblically and that people, if they were dealing with any other subject matter in the world, they would readily agree that the obvious understanding is the case. But when it comes to something biblical that they may not agree with, then they will do all sorts of mental gymnastics and, and convoluted logic to try to uh, twist and distort things to make sense to themselves. I've noticed that too. And it's rather unfortunate because people do that to their own demise. People will do that and put their own souls at risk. And so with that thought in your mind, uh, turn your attention to the first few verses in chapter 4 from the book of Hebrews. It says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them, the Israelites, but the message they heard did not benefit them, or your translation may say profit them, because they were not united or uh, mixed with faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Fundamentally, the Israelites had heard the word of God. They had heard the truth. They had seen the power of the living God. What seems to us to be so obvious, just do what God said. You saw his mighty works. You've been led out of the the nation of Israel, you have been brought to the, the Mount Sinai there, you have received the law, you now have a beautiful tabernacle out there, you have manna every day, you have quail, God is taking care of you, you've got water in a, a parched and dry land, and yet God tells us that they did not enter into his rest. They heard God's word, and now we have a warning here, you've heard the word of God, what happens? when we don't heed it? What happens when we don't listen to what God has said? Now, the, the title is uh, intentionally provocative here in, in the, along those veins, but believe it or not, in the words that we just read, in that passage we just read, there is the concept of a recipe. There is the concept of taking component parts and mixing them together and producing something there. And there's actually two words I want us to look at as we kind of establish this baseline, and then we'll get into the, the rest of our lesson. But we'll end up here at uh, the time of our invitation as well if you wanted to keep that part marked. But the, when it says that they have, uh, the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard, the word from God that they heard did not benefit them or profit them. That word in the Greek means to combine the individual parts, to combine multiple parts, so that the result is something greater than the sum of those component parts. 
We understand the concept of profit in the capitalistic world. We understand the, the, uh, in the business world what profit is. You take whatever your capital is, whatever your people are, whatever your, uh, your needs are to, to put into that business, and all of those component parts go together, and hopefully as your customers start giving you their money and you start selling your, your wares or whatever the case may be, at the end of the day or at the end of the month or however long you tabulate that, Hopefully, all of those component parts did not cost as much as the money that you've got coming in. That, that all of those component parts, when added there together, produced something that was greater than what you started with. Your bank account got bigger. You made a profit. It also says there that the problem that they encountered, because this did not benefit them, says they were not united by faith with those who listened. Uh, that word there means to mix or to permeate, and it means also to combine component parts in a way that the result is distinctly different and superior to what you started out with. Now, we, uh, we see that as it pertains to the Word of God, uh, uh, hopefully very readily. Uh, you look at your Bible, you see the different instructions that come from God, you see uh, the instructions that have come through the inspired writers, you see instructions and commands that are given by Jesus Christ himself. But as we read through the Bible, we may have uh, an indication or instruction over here, we may have another one over here that, that dovetails with it. The two component parts are then added together. We take the teaching that we receive here, the teaching that we receive here, and all of these things added together produce something that is truly amazing. Because what they produce is a child of God in Christ Jesus. Now the easiest way to kind of understand this concept here and how it relates to being a, um, a recipe of sorts is a very, a very easy illustration to understand. At least it was for me. We'll try it on y'all, see if it works for y'all. But if you take tea leaves... Nice, dry tea leaves. Put them in your mouth, chew them up. Is it any good? No. But if you boil them, and now you've taken some hot water, you've added to it some heat, now you add those leaves into that hot water. Now you've got something working. Because it's producing something that is better, as well as distinctly different from those dry leaves you just munched on. Certainly better and distinctly different from that water that you boiled, but then you add some sugar to it. Now we've got sweet tea. Now we're talking. Now it is something that is superior in every way to each of the component parts. And that's the word that is given there. That's what we do when we take the teachings of God and we allow them to mix together, to permeate our heart in our lives, and we actually begin applying those things. And so now we have a recipe for salvation. Now we have a means of understanding how the Bible teaches us and what is expected of us. All right? So now, let's make some pancakes. Do you all like pancakes? I love pancakes. I think we have, uh, we have an, an expectant pancake eater right here out, out toward the front. But I, I, I was almost threatened if I wasn't going to be making some pancakes. Did I ever see that as a threat? No, we, uh, we want to take this very seriously here. But I, ladies, y'all may understand this a little bit better. I had to do some research before I came up with this. But here's two lists of ingredients. And you'll see that they're very, very similar. And I want to ask you, what difference does it make? All right, you got flour and flour. You got baking powder. You got baking powder. You got salt, salt, sugar, sugar, milk. We're good. One egg versus three eggs. That can't possibly make a difference. And then you've got butter and you've got shortening. Same thing, right? It's the same recipe. You like this one better? You take that. If that's what you prefer, you can take that. If you like this list, if that's what you prefer, you can take that one, right? Well, I don't know. Now let's look at this one. How about sugar, brown sugar, water, and vanilla extract? I'll go ahead and tell you that granny's recipe for homemade syrup right there just in case y'all were wondering and yes it's absolutely delicious or the other group has butter and milk shortening cocoa confectioner sugar and vanilla extract the same exact stuff right you're going to produce the exact same result right no you guys must know something 
that I don't know. It seems to me like that should be interchangeable. You just pick one. Whichever one you like, whichever one suits you the best, that's what you get. What difference should it make? Well, there's a great big old stack of pancakes. That was that recipe that was there on the left. That was the syrup that you got from the top down. The other one produces this. Now, I'm here to tell you, and I want to go on record just in case anybody's confused. If you bring me this, I'm okay with that. It's all okay. I will gladly participate in that. But what if I said, go and make pancakes? What if that's what I had asked you before all of this started? Now does it matter? It does if you want pancakes. It does if that's what you have intended to make all along. It does in an instance, if we're looking at the Great Commission, when Jesus said, go and make disciples, because he told us precisely how to do that. Because Jesus was very clear, but yet we live in a religious realm we live in a culture that would tell you it simply doesn't matter. You get to pick whichever recipe you want. You get to add whatever you want to into there, and it'll make something. But it will not make a disciple of Jesus Christ. It may make a good, kind, moral person. It may make one of the most benevolent people you have ever known. It may develop into somebody that is just simply one of the greatest citizens in your community but it will not make a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. You must take the component parts of what the Word of God has expressed to us, and you must use that recipe. You must combine them in such a way that it does make something that is truly distinctive. It does make something that is phenomenally more than what you started out with. When we hear the gospel and we see uh, where the, the scriptures teach us in component parts that we must believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, that He is the Christ, the Messiah. And that in believing that Jesus is the Christ, in believing that He is the Lamb of God who gave His life uh, as a sacrifice for all people of all time, for the sins of the whole world, that in contemplating these things, I hear God's call to repent, to turn away from my sin and turn back to Him, to turn away from the path that I was walk, walking down and to turn back and follow Jesus to Him. But that in repenting of my sins based upon my faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I also must acknowledge before people that Jesus is my Lord that He is my King, that He is my Master, and not be ashamed of Him in front of friends or family. But in doing that and in arriving to that point, I also now must present myself to God as an obedient servant of His and to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, where I'm joined together with Christ by the power of God and also by the power that raised Jesus from the dead, He will now raise me up to walk in new life. And as these component parts are there, the icing on that cake, if you will, or the syrup on that stack of pancakes, is the faithful Christian life. All of those component parts produce something that God desired. And what God has told us to do in that Great Commission is go and make disciples. And there's a specific way in order to do that. And we need to honor God, and we need to honor His Word in order to do that, in order to, to follow through with what He has called us to do. We have an obligation for that. But at the same time, we hearken back to that passage in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. This isn't about preferences. This isn't about what I want. This isn't about what I prefer. This is about what God desires and what God prefers because He has made Himself known and He has made Himself clear and He has given us what we need in order to make disciples of all nations. All right, so let's look at this and, and uh, turn your attention there to, to Mark, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 28 and that great commission uh, that is recorded in that place as Jesus was preparing uh, to depart. 
Picking up in verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. Notice the obedience there. What would have happened if they had gone to a different mountain? What would have happened if they said they preferred the Mount of Olives? Anything wrong with the Mount of Olives? No. Did Jesus like to go there in the past? Absolutely. Was that where they were to meet him on that occasion? Absolutely not. Why? Because God said so. Jesus told them, this is where I want to meet you. So they're following his instructions uh, to that point. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. There's the command, there's the charge. This is what we're trying to do. And now Jesus is going to tell us exactly how to do it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Those things go hand in hand. Those are component parts that cannot be separated. If we leave out any part or if we add in something extra, we may end up with something, but we're not going to end up with disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in order to accomplish what God has called upon us uh, to, to share with the world, we must do things God's way. Remember when I started out asking the question, have you ever noticed how people have an easy time understanding obvious things, except when you're talking about religion? The way this is constructed should leave no room for misunderstanding. The way that this is laid out, it should be very easy to understand. Let's, let's think about Mark's uh, account of the gospel. When he says, go and, and preach the gospel to every creature, and the one who believes and is baptized should be saved. Shall be saved, didn't he? Isn't it interesting how little words mean things like that and change the meaning? The one who believes and is baptized shall be saved say that was a promise from jesus christ right there but so many people will say you know all you got to do is believe no but jesus said believe and be baptized now if i told you same group of people and i said you know i'm going to going to give away a brand new pickup truck what you have to do is you have to come and fill out an entry form, and then you have to take that entry form and present it, and they'll give you the free pickup truck. How many people would just show up at the dealership and say, I want my truck? Or how many would understand that you had to go and fill out the information and take it to the dealership? They would gladly comply with both parts there. But boy, when it take, you mentioned baptism, People's heads explode, and they suddenly can't understand that very simple means of human communication, baptism and belief. Belief and baptism. Both of them are necessary. Here we have this instance that, that says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There are multiple component parts to the Great Commission. But if you look at that, baptizing them would be an equivalent in making those pancakes of mixing the batter. Because the recipe says all those parts, you put them in there, you mix them up, and then you pour it on the griddle. The same construction is found there if we were mixing the pancake batter and then pouring it onto the griddle as you have baptizing and teaching them. Both of those are necessary to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you are not baptized into Christ. Likewise, you're going to struggle if you are not properly taught, continuously taught, properly discipled, and we do not complete that process. It produces something different than what God intended that doesn't mean that their baptism wasn't valid that means that it didn't get fully baked it means that it was an incomplete process 
So we see that, and we can look around this world, and we see all kinds of people that understand the concept that I need to love my neighbor as myself. I need to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I need to love my enemies. I need to pray for those that, that uh, spitefully use me, those that, that say such difficult things and, and hurtful things about us. We get all those things, and there's plenty of people in this world that understand the concept of turning the other cheek. There's all kinds of people that understand of singing praises to God, and all, but they want to draw the line, and for some reason, they will refuse to obey the command to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins and say it's unnecessary. Well, if it is unnecessary, flour is not necessary to pancakes because it's all part of what makes a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we look at this and we, we see what's going on here, when Paul was going and he was going through his, uh, his mission work and... and, uh, and uh, completing these things, he would always double back. He would always return to the places that he had been before, and he would touch base with them. Let's go to Acts chapter 14. And I want us to look at one uh, instance here where he did that very thing. He doubled back and, and met with the disciples again. And we're going to pick up in, in chapter 14 and verse 20. It says, But when the disciples gathered about him, he, Paul, rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on uh, with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, notice the language there. Go and make disciples. How did he do that? He preached the gospel. Isn't it interesting how nothing has changed? How do we make disciples today? Go and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things whatsoever. But now he goes on, and it says that uh, when he had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, and with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. When we look at that and we see uh, what it is that, that uh, is there, there are several words that appear, and each one of these that are all part of that continual discipling uh, process that Paul engaged in, all of these are, are presented to us as things that are ongoing and continuous into the future. Discipling never stops. It is something that we have, uh, have lost sight of in so many ways. And it is sad to see one, a, a new life, a, a, a new life in Christ that is born, rising from the waters of baptism. And then somehow we convince ourselves that they now have it made, that they now have it all figured out, and somehow they can make it without that additional teaching. Anybody remember the first time you drove a car? What would it have been like if your education in how to drive ended that day? You thought you were a good driver. I'm going to bet you weren't. <laughs> I certainly wasn't as good of a driver. I'm not going to say I'm a great driver. I wasn't as good of a driver then as I am now. Why? Because of experience. Because there were times when somebody who was a better driver, or maybe even just a more observant driver than me, saw something that I was doing wrong, something I could have been doing better, and helped me correct that. Well, if that helps us in our driving, you think it might help us in our Christian walk? Why is it we think that everybody can figure this out on their own? All of this is ongoing. All of this is continuing. All of this is necessary in making the disciples that God desires. Let's look at another example, Acts chapter 2. We find that following the, the Pentecost, following that time when the church was born, 
following that time when Peter obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ and went and uh, presented, preached the gospel to all those who were in attendance there in Jerusalem that very first time. They heard that gospel message. They were pierced to the heart. Peter told them exactly what Jesus told them to tell them. Peter told these people exactly what the Holy Spirit inspired him to teach them. Men and brothers, what must we do? Repent. Every one of you, on the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He told them exactly what Jesus had taught them to. But then beginning a few verses later, we find that the people didn't stop. You see, these were some stubborn folks, if ever there were some. They kept on meeting together. They kept on soaking in the apostles' doctrine. They kept on fellowshipping with each other. They kept on spending time together. These folks, in the same way uh, as Paul, going back around to all the, the converts there, they kept on exhorting. They kept on devoting themselves to the teaching. They kept on fellowshipping. They kept on giving. They kept on continuing. They kept on praising God. And what happened? The people around them and their community were in awe. And grace was just one of those things that people began to come and, and understand a little bit more. People were amazed at what this group of people were doing. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Think about that. Oftentimes, we kind of take that role on ourselves, don't we? We want to play God in that respect because we're the ones that are deciding who's going to go and, and join a church. That's God's job. Our job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to baptize. Our job is to continue teaching them all things whatsoever that Jesus has commanded us to teach and to keep on to never let up. Far too often we'll take our foot off the gas as congregations. We, we get settled. We were talking about this the other, uh, the other day with the, with the idea of what the proper congregation size is. One of the things that I've noticed in talking to people and just in personal observances is that, that congregations tend to plateau or tend to relax when they build their second building. And I don't know what there is about it. There's a lot of zeal. There's a lot of fervor. There's a lot of excitement. And, and the group begins to grow. And everybody's excited. And, and you get your first building. And then all of a sudden, you outgrow it. And, and you've you got to start that building program. And everybody's excited. We've got to keep things moving. We've got to keep things moving. But boy, you get that second building. And whew, we have got it made. And you shift into neutral. And you slow down. And the evangelism scree uh, screeches to a because we have forgotten that our job is to go and make pancakes. We have forgotten that we are to go and to preach the gospel to every creature and remind them that the one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. To remind them that our objective in this is not to tell them they're wrong. Our objective in this is not to win arguments. Our objective is solely to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that disciples are the result, so that they are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and that they are continually taught the things that God has decreed that they need to, to learn and to know. We need to keep on making uh, disciples. We need to realize that this process simply never stops. And we serve in communities. We serve in congregations. We serve in groups of people that all you have to do is look around this room and see the differences in us. When you go into the foreign mission field, you see differences in people there. When you go into another state, you see even more differences there. Everywhere you go, it's easy to see all these differences. There is only one hope for this world in these differences that divide us, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, period. And if we want to overcome the baggage of racism in this country, 
Who but the Lord's church is equipped to do that? Why? Because our God is greater than any hatred known to man. Because if we can learn to put these things aside, won't our Lord be glorified in, in us, in our congregations? Won't our world see something that is truly amazing if we can strip these things away? How many of you, as some of our more seasoned members here, or maybe you've had family members, how many of you ever felt like just because of your age and maybe your gray hair that you were just kind of set aside a little bit? There's no retirement plan on this side of eternity for Christians. And it is equally wrong to sit down and retire in the pew as it is for a younger person to write you off because of your age. We need to understand each other. The Bible is complete with information telling us older women teach the younger. But if you've ever spent time around Bible Bowl and you've ever spent time around lads, the leaders, and leaderettes or whatever, anytime you write off some of these young people thinking, that, well, they just don't know anything yet, you need to talk to some Bible Bowl participants and you need to sit down and take that test and see how much some of our young people actually know. But it's so easy when we're older, when we're more mature, you just write them off that they're just kids. That's evil. That's wrong. And it is not allowing us to fully disciple one another. We have things that we can teach people. You want to understand uh, what it is like? Young people, you want to get to know older people? I told this to my kids. I'll tell it to any young people that will listen. You want to engage a conversation with somebody a couple of generations ahead of you? Ask them one simple question. What was it like when you were my age? You better sit down because you're going to get an ear fill. Am I right? Amen. We need to talk. We need to talk about life. We need to talk about the things that are important. But if that talk does not include spiritual things, we're not discipling one another. We're not continuing to learn from one another. And the church will never be all that God intends for it to be. Different life stages. We're, my wife and I have just become empty nesters, and at almost the same time we became grandparents. Our life perspective is so much different than it was 20 years ago. Does that mean we're worthless? No. Does that mean we're better than anybody else? No. It simply means that we're at a different point in our lives. We need to engage people that have already been through this. And we need to engage people who have yet to go through this. We have something to offer. People have things to offer us. We need to bridge these gaps. We need to be able to take the teachings of Scripture, apply them to our lives, allow it to produce something in us that is far greater than the component parts. Something that truly glorifies God, and then spiritual maturity. This is one of those that is very, very difficult because for the most part, I either don't know you or just met you. I honestly don't know what your level of spiritual maturity is, but you know what my inclination is? I'll pick on him because he just fed me dinner. Brother Brian, he's got some gray hair going there, right? So I, I should be able to assume that that is a spiritual mature man. I have no idea whether he was immersed into Christ a week ago or whether he's a full-blown atheist that somebody just invited over here to this meeting. I don't know. To me, he looks like a fine Christian man. Outside appearances can be deceiving. Why do we assume that somebody that is older is spiritually mature? And we don't need to teach them. We don't need to disciple them anymore. Why do we want to write somebody off just because their body is aging? assuming that they're spiritually mature at the same, uh, same rate. Y'all took a chance and hired a young preacher. Kudos to all of you. He's a fine Christian man, but if I met him on the street, how would I know that? My inclination would be to make an assumption. He's younger than me. Obviously, he's less mature than me. <laughs> Those are dangerous ass uh, um, assumptions to make. So when we look around, and we look around us in our, our congregations, when we look around in our Bible classes, when we look around in the church parking lot, in the foyer, in the fellowship meals, wherever we find ourselves, 
let's try to get to know one another on a deep level so that we truly know who it is that we're talking to. We truly knew what we, have, uh, what we have to offer them. We truly then can know what they have to offer us. And together, we can disciple each other. Because this is the plan that God has given to us. Our salvation doesn't stop at baptism. It starts then. Our walk doesn't end when we arise from those waters. It starts at that point. And if we baptize, but we don't teach, then we don't have what God has called upon us to produce. When we see that, that whole idea again, the, uh, the uh, go and, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever uh, I have uh, commanded you. We also have that, uh, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. And in, in essence, at that point, there's the cooking of this. All of those component parts uh, have now been handled. The batter has been mixed with the proper ingredients. It's been poured on the griddle, and now it's time to cook. And we mature. We are transformed by the living God. The Spirit produces love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. All of these things, this self-control that we need, the Spirit produces these in us. This is what we are, uh, uh, we are workmen, the workmanship of God. This is what God uh, is doing in us. And we need to understand it is our duty to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the process of making disciples to complete all of this. We can understand it with a recipe for making pancakes. We have a difficult time understanding it in the spirit realm, but grammatically, you lay them out the exact same way. It's easy to understand the one, but why is it so difficult for us to understand the other? As we kind of uh, wrap all of these things up, I would, I would invite you to turn to Hosea chapter 7. There's a, a statement is made there that, that bears on what we're looking at uh, here and, and the accusation against uh, Israel, the accusation against Ephraim uh, is made in this point. And it says in, in verse uh, 8 and 9 uh, there that Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. You see, for him, he had the wrong ingredients that he was mixing together. He was commanded by God to be separated from the peoples around him. Yet he was mixing with them, and the result is that Ephraim is a cake not turned. I asked y'all if y'all like pancakes. There was general agreement. Nobody walked out when I asked that question. How many of y'all like pancakes that are just cooked on the one side? Not quite so good, is it? There's something wrong with that. Why? We all know it because that side that wasn't cooked isn't done yet. The process wasn't completed yet. It is not what it should be, and it certainly is not what it could have been. And Ephraim, because they did not listen to the word of God, because they did not heed the teaching of God, because they didn't take all of the principles, all of the teaching all of the spiritual ingredients and mix them together and then finish the cooking process. Ephraim's a cake unturned. It's something that is distasteful. You take a great big old bite, you're going to spit it out of your mouth. And that's precisely what God was saying. You started something, but you did not finish it. You did not do all that I commanded you. And you did not finish it. And what it has produced is something, but it is not what I intended. Now with that in mind, go back to Hebrews chapter 4. In chapters 3 and 4, all of this story is coming into uh, the minds of the, uh, the people who are, are hearing this for the first time and a recounting of what God did 
with the Israelites in the wilderness. Back in chapter 3, it tells us on several locations there, uh, beginning in verse 7. Today, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Down in verse 10, He says, Therefore, I was provoked with that generation. They said they always go astray in their hearts. In verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. And in verse uh, 13 it says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, in uh, verse 15, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Down in chapter 4, uh, looking at uh, verse uh, 7, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You notice a pattern there? There's an urgency that is there in this great teaching of that, that spanned a period of 40 years. Every single day of that 40 years, God stood before His people, the people that He had commissioned to teach, the people that He had commissioned to convey these great truths, were telling the people everything in precise detail, what God expected of them and how they were to relate to Him and how they were to relate to the people around them, how they were to worship, how they were to be cleansed, all of that instruction that was going on there. And the Holy Spirit of God said, Today, Listen to me today. Hear me. And these were the people that it did not mix. It did not produce something that was spectacular. Something that was greater than the component parts. Because each of those days when God said, Today, if you will hear His voice, they shut out part of it or all of it. There was in them a hardening of their hearts. Today, as you have heard this lesson, is your heart softened or hardened? They go astray in their hearts. Perhaps you are wandering in your faith. Perhaps you are wandering from what God has called you to do and who God has called you to be. Or perhaps there is in someone here an evil heart of unbelief, that there's a nugget of faith, but that there is a great gap, that gap of unbelief. If you remember the father who called Jesus to heal his child, and Jesus said, if you believe, and he said, I believe, help my unbelief. And evil crept in and got into these hearts that had that faith gap. And as surely as it happened to the Israelites in the desert, it can happen to the Christian today. And as we think on these things, and we think about the, the commission that God gave to us through His Son, Jesus Christ, we're here at a gospel meeting. I think the go and preach the gospel part is, is okay. We're in good shape there, right? But what about that, the one who believes? and is baptized. Maybe you heard the gospel tonight for the first time. And you're wondering, well, I believe in Jesus. What next? If you are not baptized, if you do not obey the fullness of the gospel, then you are a cake unturned. Because all that God has asked has gone unfulfilled. Parts of it may be there, but you still do not end up with what God decreed. So tonight, whatever your need may be, that commission that Jesus gave to us extends to the unbeliever, it extends to the partial believer, and it extends to the Christian who is still a cake unturned. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. We would invite you to come if you have these needs or any others as we stand together and sing.